Lighthouse keeper Tom Henderson was enjoying the spectacle that 12th of February in 1935. The biggest airship in the world, the U.S. Navy's flying aircraft carrier Macon, was passing by on our way back to base. And then the scene changed. Henderson was the first one from the mainland to actually see the tail fin rip from the stern of the Macon. In the steering room, Navy helmsman Bill Clark remembered the rudder being jolted right out of his hands. The doggone fins, Clark would later complain. He wished they had used the German design with its superior structural bracing. But there was no time to think about that now because Clark was busy trying to fly a ship that was acting a bit like a giant balloon with the knot untied. In the control car, U.S. Navy Commander Herbert Wiley sent an SOS to Navy ships in the area. The structural failure caused lots of pieces of metal and things to puncture the after three gas cells. The ship immediately put on full power to keep from dropping into the water. She went up into the clouds. She started gaining elevation until she got to an altitude of 4,800 feet. The ship was set up to actually outgas healing when it reached a height, which worked against them, and the ship started plummeting slowly down to the ocean. We now had a, a sinking situation. It was not the first time Wiley had experienced this sinking feeling. He had been operations officer on the naval airship Shenandoah when it crashed during an Ohio thunderstorm in 1925. Thirteen officers and men died in the crash. Wiley and 29 others survived. Eight years after the Shenandoah disaster, Wiley rode the Macon sister ship Akron down into the Atlantic during a storm off the coast of New Jersey. The Navy dirigible Akron is gone. Seventy-three homes are desolate in mourning for men who will not return. Inside the stricken aircraft, the men had little chance, according to experts. Most of them were drowned as the dirigible sank into the sea. The wreck had spared only second-in-command Wiley and two others. It was not long before Wiley got orders that would give him yet another opportunity to live up to his name. Just 18 months after the Akron went down, he reported as commanding officer of the Navy's sole remaining airship, the Macon. Attention! Navy Department, Bureau of Navigation, Washington. With the Shenandoah and Akron disasters fresh in the public mind, the Navy was counting on Wiley to prove that the naval airship had a future. And the Macon was the last ship left to do it with. These orders were specific that he should fly it and prove to the Navy that they were worthwhile. Although its World War I role as a heavy bomber had been taken over by fixed-wing aircraft, the airship was still the best source of long-range reconnaissance. It's up ship for Navy Day at Sunnyvale, California, as the giant dirigible Macon goes aloft on a demonstration flight to show you how our only air warship operates. The cloud car. A one-man observation car is lowered away. This enables the huge airship to float above the clouds, hidden from the ground, while the lone observer below the clouds reports by telephone. But this high-wire act was nothing compared to the Macon's other aerial wizards, the Sparrowhawk pilots, otherwise known as the men on the flying trapeze. The men on the flying trapeze were a group of hot pilots. They flew the five aircraft, had a very famous patch that my father designed. It was called the man on the flying trapeze. The large man on the trapeze is the airship and the small skinny guy is the sparrowhawk. In naval aviation, we use the term trap. The plane comes in, catches a wire, and he says, I trap. Guess where that term came from? It came from the trapeze on the airship. And when the guy hooked on, he was trapped. <laughs> the hook stuck on the trapeze. A officer by the name of Lieutenant Mayer climbed down that trapeze in the open, no parachute, with a monkey wrench in his hand and pounded on the hook until it released. <laughs> Wiley had been in command of the Macon 
about two months when he got an idea that he knew would catch the public's attention. He had heard that uh, President Roosevelt on the USS Houston was going to the Pacific, to Honolulu, and all my father knew was the time it would transit the Panama Canal. So he did a dead reckoning of where the ship should be, and they flew four little uh, of their aircraft, the little Sparrowhawks, and they made an intercept about 1,100 miles from shore. The captain of the ship was certainly mad because here came four little airplanes 1,100 miles out to sea, and in those days they carried a belly tank which looked like a bomb. And here they started dropping things on his ship. As a result, the commander-in-chief of the Pacific recommended my father for court-martial. President Roosevelt intervened and said it was one of the best exercises he'd ever seen and told the Navy, forget about it. So he was promoted right after that. Wiley's dramatic demonstration revived the Navy's airship program. Plans for the construction of another ship were on the drawing boards. The public was enchanted. Dirigible planes can be launched and picked up in midair, floating majestically in the sky. 785 foot flying aircraft carrier and these Sparrowhawk airplanes, little parasites flying around doing their maneuver. But the Navy's airships were destined never to see combat. The Macon had a date with destiny in the skies off the coast of California. On February 12, 1935, the Macon, having participated for about a week with the United States Pacific Fleet maneuvers off of Southern California, they were passing Point Sur when she had a structural failure in which a wind shear ripped the upper fin off. Having sent out an SOS to the fleet, the fleet was responding and proceeding to where the crash scene was as fast as they could. They landed in the water tail first. The first casualty was the radioman who wore glasses. He lost his glasses. Uh, he jumped and he was lost. The other casualty of the total crew was a mess steward who for some reason or other ran aft where the, it was, the ship was in the water. They waited until the nose got down far enough they could safely get into their life rafts, waited for the naval vessels to come. Fortunately, the U.S. Navy's fleet was nearby and was there to rescue. Of the 83 on board, there were only two fatalities. I think my father was the most experienced airship man in the country, and I think he knew what he was doing. Although Wiley's skill and experience limited the loss of life to just two, the crash of the Macon effectively ended the Navy's program in rigid naval airships. But although the airship no longer cast its giant shadow on the ground, it lived on in the minds of those who had witnessed it. One of those was David Packard, co-founder of the Hewlett Packard Company. As an engineering student at Stanford University in the early 30s, Packard remembered being drawn to the window of the classroom as the giant ship crossed overhead. Years later, he would decide to fund the organization and the technology needed to find and preserve maritime treasures like the Macon on the ocean floor. With this new effort, the great airships, their lost men and their outmoded technologies, which had served the national defense, would become a bridge to a new generation of men and machines in the service of exploration. We go to visit the Macon site. The Western Flyer research vessel is now hovering over the Macon site. Our little parasite planes are now the ROV, tethered underneath the Western Flyer, bringing light to a relatively dark area under the seafloor where the Macon was casting shadows and taking light away as it traversed the United States. So there's a lot of pride in this, plus the unique design of the Macon, a flying aircraft carrier. It's important that we give respect to that site and those sailors. <laughs>